Calling all book lovers, this one's for you. Ever wonder if that old book on your shelf is worth something? How could you figure out? Or where should you go if you want to find the best signed copy of your favorite author's book? On this episode of The Writer's Journey, international booksellers Susan Rabden and Wilfred DeFreitas join us to answer all of your book dealing and wheeling questions. Susan and Wilfred, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. We'll try to, we'll try to answer some of the questions anyway, if not all. Yay, it's good seeing you guys again, just to like get it out to, on the internet. Susan is my cousin, so we have a little bit of nepotism going on today, and I it's love funny. it. But um, family, family's family, great. That's right. It's gonna, it's it's got good vibes already. <laughs> we also have Corey Gillum in the show and Kayleen, and that's it for now. Yeah, we're here. We're gonna jump in, talking all things that you wouldn't think we would be talking about, but I'm super excited because I'm actually secretly a book collecting nerd. Like I will go and I'm just like, ooh, that looks really old. And then I'll like, I'll look and see, I'm just like, yes, 1800 something, buying it. Like I don't even, I don't even care what the title is. I just I want it because it's an old book. So that's me. I'm weird yes. like that. Yes, today, um, partly in your honor, guys, <laughs> I tore out all my bookshelves, took all the books out dusted them all off each one reorganized the whole thing put them back and now i feel like i'm surrounded by my book babies just kind of everywhere books i love it there you go well we're surrounded with book babies down in our book room but uh we pulled a few out in case we needed some up here while we were talking Ooh, so what we love show and tell yeah show and tell so what have you guys been up to lately well of course normally we're um we do our business exhibiting at physical book fairs, but um, of course, the, for the last 12 months, hmm. we've been restricted to doing this online, so then, um, yeah. just showing a few books, which is rather difficult because, of course, when we go to a book show, we take, you know, two or 300 books. And then if we do a virtual book show, uh, book fair, rather, as we call them, they are um, restricted to maybe 15 or 20. Yeah. So, you know. Oh. It's, it's difficult to make sure you choose the right 15 or 20. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> Kayleen, you mentioned earlier, um, just now, uh, uh, at the beginning, you said something about picking down an old, taking down an old book. Um, and I think it's worth mentioning that uh, as far as if we're talking about book collecting. And value. And values. Um, age isn't necessarily a factor. Um, it can be. You can You can have a book that's, you know, 20 years old, that's worth a lot, and a book that's 100 years old, that's worth absolutely nothing. So uh, my my fascination with, this is my personal value, so it's yeah. like nothing about like, like the actual monetary value, is yeah. this thing has been around for 200 years, and now it's in my hands, and I just, just yeah. there's just that, that connection of history. How many people have leafed through this and read it, you know, and I love it when I find, you know, like little, little in the margins, like someone's like putting their thoughts in there. I found a, an herbal book um, for herbal remedies that was from sometime in the 1900s, early, early, and in it were pressed flowers. Now, I have no idea if those pressed flowers are from the early 1900s or from someone who just maybe in recent times got it and put flowers in there, but just the idea that they could be hmm. was just like, fills me with so much golden joy. And um, there's another book that had nothing to do with what I found in it. I'm kind of jumping ahead on questions, but um, I had found some old World War um, paper money in it. Like the little, like the actual like sheets that they get for their cool. yeah, rations and whatnot. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I just thought that was so cool. I'm just like, it's like from like the Cold War and it's just been like tucked away in this book that I found and bought and then I'm leaping through it and it's like these pages start falling out and I'm like, dude, <laughs> I'm getting pieces of history. I just love that. That's well you I mean one of the things that that you're you're pointing out very, very quickly here is that book collecting is a hugely personal thing. Um we've we've had people come up to us and say, what should I collect? And our first answer to them is collect something that speaks to you. Hmm. and that you love. And if, if you don't know what that is, just accumulate a few things that speak to you and they start defining themselves. 
for you, obviously, it's that history piece. It's that age. It's that tie back to other owners. Um, for somebody else, it might be an artist whose work they, they just absolutely fall in love with. And suddenly they find they've got, you know, four books illustrated by Arthur Rackham that just absolutely sends them. So it's a hugely personal thing. And it isn't always a matter of money. It's sometimes just a matter of what, you know, you love. If it turns out that the, the, the books you collect um, actually um, have some commercial value, that's a bonus. Mm. But we would never suggest collecting books as, as an investment or anything like that. It's just, it's just too fraught with, with, um, with un Uncertainty. un uncertainties, exactly, yeah. yes. Mm. So bringing, bringing that in mind, you know, with like the uncertainty of like the book market, what, what is like the daily life of a bookseller, like at this point, like it's, it's constantly changing, moving, shifting. So what does your life look like in this <laughs> bookseller right now, world? Looks, right now it looks very sedentary. Um, we are used to in the past traveling constantly. Uh, Lauren can tell you we're on the road all the time. We go to, to book fairs in California, in Vancouver, in Toronto. We, you know, we go to London once a year to, to, to source things and see family. Um, and so we're, we're usually constantly on the move. Of course, under COVID, that's not happening, especially not when you live in a hot spot for, for Canada. Um, so it's now we're doing a lot more of really deep research into the pieces, or as Wilfred said, doing um, virtual book fairs that are popping up all over the place, um, which incidentally are great places to go and just look at cool books and, and learn about cool books because you've got all these professional yeah. booksellers from around the world in one place, each of them with 20 or 30 books from their stock, showing some really cool stuff. Yeah. Um, I think the way we differ generally from the the bookshop, the bookseller who has a bookshop where he he or she goes in every day, opens the shop, people see things in the window, they come in, they handle books and uh, and decide they like them or speak to the bookseller, discuss the condition, what have you. Whereas we tend to go to specific uh, venues, um, maybe twenty times a year, could be in a hotel convention, it could be in a convention center, a hotel ballroom. A school gym it doesn't really matter where you gather get a gathering of uh 20 or 200 hmm. uh, booksellers um all with their own individual little kiosks as it were displaying their books and people go from one to the other and they can walk into a booth and look at the books take them down they can handle the books which is book book collecting and book um sourcing is a i think a very tactile thing yeah seeing a book on the internet and saying, I, I'd like to buy that. It's feeling the book, smelling it, mm -hmm. uh, opening the pages, seeing the type, the typography. Making Just, that connection that you make. Yeah. yeah. Both, I know with books that that's something just, once you put it in your hand, you can't yeah. let it go. And, uh, yeah. and that's, I mean, I, I miss that personally. I mean, we, of course, we can't go out and source books right now as we, we love doing. Um, but it's, uh, you know, we, you, we've got plenty of books to, to be able to research and to, and to deal with. So. I can tell the funny story about exhibiting at the book fair. And it happens more, yes. than, it's happened more than once. Whereas the, 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 the show opens and the people pour in and they go around from booth to booth. And somebody will come to our booth and look at a book and... We don't realize it, but they made a mental note of that book. Mm, and mm -hmm. They'll go around and they'll come back and that book will have sold in the meantime to somebody else who felt the same way, but bought it. And the person will said, where's my book? <laughs> <laughs> you should have bought it. <laughs> that's it that's, I'm sorry if somebody else bought it, which is um, uh, a little tip. If you're ever either in a bookshop, it doesn't matter, or at a book fair, if you see something you like, um, don't wait because uh, somebody else may have the same feeling about it. Um, yeah. Yes, they say you snooze, you lose. 
Yeah, 15 years ago, I bought a book by George McDonald. It was uh, like a, a first edition book. I have it on my shelf over there. Now, every time I see it, I think, hmm, I did not get the second book. It was there and I didn't shell out the money for it. You know, I was in high school or something and I, I thought, hey, I'll, I'll spend the money on these, like a whole box of books instead, instead of this one. And now I'm like, ah, oh, I don't know if I'll ever get see that book again. And I keep on thinking, oh, the, the one that got away. Yeah. Well, it's probably <laughs> out there. At least if you know the book you're looking for. It's I know he'd to ask to find it. <laughs> it's easy to find it on the internet because yeah. you can go to, uh, you know, Biblio or Abe or Book Finder or something and see who's got copies of it out there. Mm -hmm. um, it's the ones you don't know exist. Yeah. Um, we deal with a lot of... of very advanced collectors. I mean, we, we had one collector who collected nothing but material having to do with um, Dickens's last book, The Mystery of Edwin Drood, mm. the, un the Unfinished Story. And he had every edition of that thing you can imagine. There were one or two that he was missing because they were that rare. But I happened to find him a piece that Re made reference to it. It was a um, G.K. Chesterton and I think Shaw and somebody else doing a dramatization of it that he'd never heard of. Uh -huh. so those are those are the hard ones, the ones you've never heard of. That's what going to a book fair or a shop or yeah. to where you can look in person is is really valuable. Yeah. The serendipity of coming across something that you didn't know existed. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we I'm, in I'm our audience, sure. good, good, there you go ahead. There you go. We in our audience, we try to make sales by you know we write our own book and we put it up on the internet and we sell books that way. Um, so this is a completely different form of selling books. You're you're working with collectors. You're going to all the right spots to find good things, and you have the know-how to to know what it is that collectors are going to want. Um, what kind of turnover do you guys have to do to make a living selling books? collectible books i'm not do you, what kind of turn i'm not sure what you mean yeah you like how many books, books are you selling a year and and do, oh, oh. <laughs> how know. and to whom uh, and just yeah, how's this it's done probably, it's probably you know anywhere from from you know 500 to mm, I well maybe said, not that high no, maybe no 200 to 500 somewhere in that range yeah. Um, of course, you know, we don't have shop costs. We don't have that kind of thing. Our costs are in travel. Mm. Um, it depends on the book. Um, you know, some books will make you know, $20 on, other books will make 300 on, you know, whatever. Um, so it, it's really a it's sort of whatever each year brings. Yeah. Uh, Completely unpredictable. Put it that way. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. <laughs> yeah. I figure if I've got a roof over my head, yeah. clothes on my back, and food in my belly, I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. But uh, just to just to bring out something, since we're talking about stuff from our stock, I'm going to take the plastic off of it so it doesn't shine. Can you see what this is? Oh, the wow. the memoirs of Sherlock Holmes. I yeah, want that this book. This is the first edition of it. Oh, beautiful. Um, it's actually not the most spectacular copy out there, but it is the kind of thing we like to have in our stock. Uh, it, it's dark blue. It's got gold lettering on it. Gold on the pages. Edged. If you look at the, can you? I don't know if you can see the mm. reflection of the gilt. Oh, it's got the gold edge to it. I love when I find All books that have that. The illustrations by Sidney Paget, which are the famous ones that keep going on. This is the first time that these stories found book form. Hmm. So Wilfred collects Conan Doyle to begin with, so we always try to have Conan Doyle in um, in stock. But this is a, a 19th century book, and it's uh, in reasonably good condition. It's strong, it's holding, and um, it is the kind of thing that we take all around and hope we find somebody who who likes it and wants to own it. Sure. I mean, there will be, as Susan said, so, there will be 
more expensive copies than ours and less expensive copies. Um, but each collector tends to be guided by his or her wallet. Mm. Um, you know, what I can't afford a, a, a $10,000 copy, but I can afford a $2,000 copy. Um, so the condition in book collecting, uh, I don't know if you're going to be coming on to this, but um, condition in book collecting is the key, the key aspect to, to look for books in fine condition that that's the uh, we have you know the real estate joke about um you know location location and location well in book collecting it's condition condition and condition once mm -hmm. you've decided that a book is collectible um because you'd like to have a first edition of it uh because you read it as a uh you heard read it as a as a young person um and read it as a reprint and now you think well i'd like to have a first edition of that and as Kayleen mentioned earlier, having the book in the first edition, um, there's something magical about it. It's, it's somebody, this was the first time that the book was seen by the public. Um, in this case, the, 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 mag, the stories were published in magazines, in the first. Strand magazine first. Yeah. And then they were collected into a book form. So I, um, it's, it's, it's different people collect for different reasons, but keeping and collecting i believe is, is, is condition is condition yeah yeah mm. and sometimes it's a matter of deciding um how wh where the balance point between what the book is the condition of the book and your budget mm. where they come together um so one, with when you're speaking about condition, uh, especially for those out there who might not really know, like, are there certain, I mean, well, there probably is different levels of condition or like, what are the most like popular things that you look for as far as what will determine a fine condition, a good, a bad? Yeah, um, it, it, there's um, uh, the first thing that the book has to be complete, yeah. especially in older books um, where, the binding may have been faulty and pages could have dropped out or in books in the uh in the early part of the 20 middle part of the 20th century books where illustrations have been glued in and over time the glue has dried and the illustrations fall out or the person may unwittingly have taken an illustration out to frame it right and then the book gets passed on without an illustration hmm. so in effect the book is incomplete complete being complete as issued. But when you're, well, again, when you're talking about condition, the things to look like, look at, now this is again a 19th century. This is Darwin's Descent of Man. This is not a mm -hmm. first edition. I want to get it up for, okay. This is not a first edition. This is, I think, a boom, 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 second printing. Let me get inside, I will tell you. Second edition. 23rd printing, so 23rd thousand. Um, but if you look at it, it's bright, it's clean, it's sharp, it's not worn at the ends, it's mm. not, you know, it's not overly creased. Inside, the pages are, are tight. The So the binding the, hasn't really the been hinges broken. Are are strong. Um, hinges, by the way, are on the inside, joints are on the outside. Um, it feels good in the hand, it's, it's firm, and that it makes it a fine yeah. copy. There are no extraneous marks. Uh, marginalia is not ex necessarily extraneous marks. Those are uh, sometimes comments, and as you pointed out, Kayleen, the, those can be really interesting. Sometimes they can be defacing, but sometimes they're interesting. Um, depends on the book. <laughs> it depends on the book, exactly. I, I, I have a, a, cl a client out in, in Vancouver who, if it, a book has marginalia, he is thrilled to death. Now, this one has one thing that mars it still, which I didn't bring up. Some people would find this note ownership notation here, which is a modern 20th century plainly notation. Some people would find that horrible. I won't buy it. I don't want that in my in my books. It's my book. Other people would say, "Oh, cool! I can see who else owned it." Yeah, that's that's. I'm in that camp. That's that's sort of the personal part. 
On the other hand, just as another piece, this is, if you look at it, you can yeah, see the, this. Book the is threading like, of the books okay. coming out. It's from it's... a library. The covers, eh, sorry, the oh. cover is, <laughs> covers. Covers um, literally not attached anymore. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not even, it was originally a leather binding. Somebody has pasted cloth over it to hold it together. But what I'm going to try and do is show you the title page. Micro Megas, a comic romance mm. by Voltaire. This is the first English translation of, and I want to get this right, uh, an early science fiction work said to be the first tale involving alien visitors to Earth. What? Nice. This, it was, um, this book was published in 1753. 1753. Oh, I, love it. I don't it's care that the cover's social, coming off. I want it. Yeah, well, yeah. it's a social commentary. Um and Voltaire used that thing to, to bring up what he wanted to say about his society. Yeah. Um, so this is not a great copy of it. A terrible copy. It's a terrible copy. <laughs> of it. A really beautiful copy and a really beautiful contemporary binding would probably cost five times as much. Yeah. $2,000 yeah. okay. or so. Um, this one, you know, we're, we're, we have up for about 450 Canadian. The thing about so, it is um, with, with collecting uh, people, they're collectors are two breeds. They are either the ones who will hold out, who want to hold out for the best copy, just not mm -hmm. have any copy until they can find the perfect one. Or collectors like me, who I collect two authors. Um, if I haven't got a copy of a book, I prefer to have um, a lesser copy as a, as a what I call a stop gap copy until a final one comes along, yeah. and mm -hmm. then I'll either dispose of this one, you know, get sell it uh, cheaply, and I now have the one I that I really want to keep in my collection. Um, but some people they 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 they, they don't want to have it; they just want to wait for the perfect copy. Yeah. This is this is probably one that that somebody would buy because it was a first edition of an important book albeit in terrible condition, they might decide to take it to a restorer or a conservator and have the cover put back on professionally. But of course- Or have a fine binding. Done or have a, bind, a proper fine binding. Because this isn't the original binding to start with. Well, it may be under that cloth, but <laughs> we, who can yeah, tell? Yeah. <laughs> you know? So there, there are a lot of things that kind of come in and into it. That is really cool. So that's the birth of science fiction right there. There you go. <laughs> We're part of it. Uh, Mike Massa, he has a question for you guys. He says, what about obscure stuff? Say items published outside the U.S. I'm thinking of how one would price a multi-volume history of the Argentine Navy published in Argentina in the 1970s. Ah, first of all, you have to find somebody who, with whom, who handles that kind of material. Yeah. Um, we always recommend uh, approaching a professional bookseller um, one in near you in your area. There are there are guides to booksellers in Canada and the U.S. and in the U.K. that we're familiar with. I'm mean, sure that, that applies to European all the European countries as yeah. well. But if you're uh, if you want to know something, first of all, a bookseller usually will want to see the book firsthand. So you'd have to take take a, take a copy to the shop or have the person come to your house um, and look at the book and. But you, the person needs to be familiar with the, with the title, with with the material. With the material, R uh, rather than in order, because the, somebody who specialized in in material having to do with, in this case, naval architecture or naval naval history, will have a better idea of where to go and research that piece yeah. than someone who specializes in modern first editions. Um, if, oh, I see, wait, you, you saved it from being thrown out. I think that's a, a good thing to do. Um, what you might try and do um, is go to the, uh, assuming you're in the U.S., to the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America website, the ABAA. Look for somebody who specializes in um, naval history, naval materials. Argentina. Argentina. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> they may be someone who can give you at least a little more guidance on how to specifically look for it, um, look it up. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you know, you can try Googling it, but the problem with that is unless you know the terms that booksellers use, unless you, you know how to find out what edition you've got, it can be really confusing, probably more confusing than it is helpful. Yeah. Uh, in this day and age where you can't go where many bookshops aren't open because they're not essential businesses, I don't know where how it is where anybody else lives, but um, it's difficult here. Um, if you go online to either in the US, ABAA.org, Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America.org, or in Canada, the ABAC, the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of Canada.org, or in the UK, ABA, Antiquarian Booksellers Association, .org. Go to those websites. Uh, they, they're very often split out into the, the dealers. Well, they're always split out into the dealers. And some, some of them have a search, a search feature where you can find out uh, the geographical location of a dealer, the kind of material the dealer deals in. Yeah. And those can be the two things, uh, important things, um, to watch for and also those people who are members of those associations have a professional reputation to uphold mm. so you can be sure of fair being dealt fairly whereas if you go online and you see somebody who doesn't have those initials after their name ABA, a, ABAC in Canada ABAA in America or ABA in the UK and various other ones other in, words around in, the world. in Europe yeah. um, and, and the magic number after all of those is I lab of antiquarian booksellers. That's the key word to look for. People who are members of the, the national association associations are, by definition, um, members of the International League of Antiquarian right. Booksellers. And part of the uh, code of ethics is to deal fairly with people, with the customers, and 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 also to become a member of the national association. You have to achieve knowledge and expertise hmm. before hey guys i think we've lost the Reloading audience here hey guys, there you go <laughs> okay, are we am, there am i breaking up or are you breaking up because i can't tell oh, yeah okay. you guys Lauren, lauren's in and out so we can heal i'm fine um, uh, but anyway, what, what, we, <laughs> what we were, yay. Um, I think what we're trying to say is, um, oops, we're causing again. It, oh, coming and going here. I can hear you, but your, your video stalled. Our video? Hey, Susan? Yeah. We're, yeah, stalled a little bit. Okay. Uh, we're sh uh, we're showing ourselves, of course, but um, yeah, I think you're you back. Hear us at least? Okay, yes. Um, the the what, I think what what we're trying to say is is um, if you're dealing with um, someone who is a member of the National Association, you at least know that you're dealing with somebody who has a knowledge base that that can help you if you're trying sure. to find out information and things. Uh, and when right. they say, and talking about condition, as somebody mentioned earlier, um, uh, condition is a very subjective thing. But they tend, we tend to, in the professional associations, um, if a book is fine, that means it's pretty nice copy. If you say it's very good, it means it could have some faults. Good, hmm, could be a problem. Could be one of, could be a stopgap copy. Maybe not even that. Yeah, and then you have things like a fair copy or a binding copy, which is what uh, Susan just and showed. The Omega the, 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 yeah. the Voltaire. Um, yeah. That's a binding copy, really. Uh, so they have, but different people will have different um, criteria for denoting condition. But in the professional associations, you'll find that they're pretty um, reliable. Hmm. So you Definitely need to know what these idea. terms mean. Yeah, sorry. Definitely a good yeah. idea to check those places out to protect yourself, you know, from you could have something that's worth yesness and 
at least going to these professional organizations, you won't get swindled out of your potential monies. Yeah. Am I and if there is a dispute, up? by the way, there's a resolution, uh, dispute resolution me mechanism in, in for the members of those associations. Yeah. Whereas if you, not, that's not to say that you could, that there are other people who are not members um, who aren't competent. Right. There are lots of very respect, very highly re reputable members, uh, excuse me, booksellers, who for reasons of their own don't, don't want to be a member of yeah. an association. Yeah. The best thing to do is, is as you get to, you know, as you move into collecting, um, assuming that's what you want to do, um, as you move into collecting, start to get to know the dealers that you're dealing with. Talk to them, ask questions, see what they are, you know, what they, what they think, what they say, what they, how you feel about them, because building a relationship in, as in any of these things, as in working with an editor or working with, once you start developing a personal relationship, you get to the point where you understand that that dealer and you know whether you're not, you can trust somebody. Um, there are always exceptions to the rule, but um, that's always a good, a good way to, to move forward. And that's something that a book fair, once they get back online, will really help you with. If there's a book fair near you, go there, have fun, touch yeah. things, pull a book that you've always wanted to see off the shelf and look at it. Even if you can't afford it, just enjoy it. Um, it's it's half the fun of, of book collecting is is just touching stuff. It's a very sensual thing. And I think a lot of people are starting to plan out trips for, you know, dream trips for what they'd like to do when the pandemic is over. Um, where are some of those destination book fairs that you would like to put on people's radar screens? Number one, California Antiquarian Book Fair. It is the largest antiquarian book fair in the world. Uh, the years, it alternates between, San, between Oakland, Oakland and Pasadena. Essentially San Francisco and Los Angeles. And LA. The year that it's in the north, it, I think it topped out at 230 international dealers. Wow. Um, I think Pasadena got up to 190 something like that, maybe 200, but it's huge. We figured out once if you went to this book fair and you were there for the entire time it was open, which is Thursday evening through Sunday evening, um, you could spend a maximum of five minutes in each booth on average. Um, but of course wow. there will be booths you walk past and you go, okay, there's nothing in there that interests me. I'm going to go over there because that looks like cool stuff. Um, you might miss the book you wanted in the one you passed by, but that's the chance yeah. you take. And it is, it can blow your mind. I mean, you can go into booths where there is nothing under $10,000 and they're all huge, fabulous 17th century plate books, hand colored, whatever. Um, I walk around there. I've been in this business for 30 odd years. You've been in it for about 40 years. And you can still walk into booths that just completely blow your mind. It's, wow. it's, a, it's fantastic. Yeah. It on, is a place to go. But getting on the West Coast of California book fairs, um, and on the East Coast, you've got New York and Boston. Boston. Um, and there are a host of other book fairs. Sure. Um, is there a w website that carries uh, book well, fairs? Well, uh, the, the iLab book, the iLab website, ILAB.org, is it? Yeah. ILAB.org. Um, does list all of the iLab book fairs, all of the ones that are, that are sponsored by national associations. So it'll have the Toronto book fair, it'll have New York, Boston, California, London, Paris. Yeah, but there are a host um, of other book fairs that they, you can go they, to. Yeah, and they, the do list, they do list some of the local ones, but within each country, their, their national association will often have pages that list other book fairs. We run Canada's smallest book fair. <laughs> It's 12 to 15 dealers. It's a little local thing here in Westmount in, in Montreal, but it's great fun. Um, you know, people will bring books from $5 to $500 or more. And, and you can just sit there and spend an afternoon poking your way through books. So there may be local book fairs. There may be, you know, national book fairs. There are all kinds of levels all around. Um, and they're just, they're, they're a hoot to yeah. go to. 
Yeah, it, it's interesting that the um, uh, a lot of bookshops are closing now because <laughs> book, bookshops not not very um, high earners for the um, for the uh, people who own the shops, and they went into areas where the rent was low, and the bookshops could afford to operate. And then those areas become gentrified. And oh yeah, more valuable, and the booksellers not being in a high income business, um, they get put out of business. So bookshops are in decline in many cities. Lucky ones move. Huh? Lucky ones move. move. Yeah. We, we know one guy who's now moved for the third time and he's just kind of holding on till the pandemic ends and we'll see yeah, what happens. Um, I hope he makes uh, it out. <laughs> yeah. so going to a book fair is like going to 15 or 20 or 200 little bookshops all in one place. Mm. Um, well, we were probably talking too much about book fairs because that's what we do. Right. But, um, are, are people having other questions? We don't want to talk about what we do all the time. Yeah. Uh, well, that's why well. we have you here. But before we get into more questions, you gave okay. me a perfect segue into our spotlight for today. So thank you for that. All righty. Today's spotlight. Am I clear first? I just want to make sure because on my end, it's been real weird. I don't know if I'm going in and out. Okay. Today's spotlight is on Blood and Steel, a military sci-fi series, Tranquility, book one, by Josh Hayes and Devin C. Ford. They came to start a new life. Now they have to fight for it. Joel Lander wants nothing more than a fresh start, far from Earth and wars that have left humanity's birthplace in shambles. Leaving on the second mission to the distant world of Tranquility, Lander and his family plan to build a brand new life for themselves. Boasted to be everything Earth wasn't, clean, unsullied, safe, Lander learns upon arrival that tranquility is anything but. New independence has gone dark, and it soon becomes clear that he will have to fight a terrifying enemy to save their new home, forcing him back into the very life he'd thought he'd left behind on Earth. Experience the start of an action pack an action-packed new military sci-fi epic from best-selling authors Josh Hayes, The Valor Trilogy, and Devin C. Ford, After It Happened. Starcraft meets Titanfall in a thrilling battle for survival. And doom! Click. Oh, out in the wild, June 8th. Click and pre-order now. There we go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey! Sounds good. And scene. And scene. <laughs> Well, in Keystroke, we've had some talk about finding signed copies and finding copies specifically of um, like superhero type books mm. and science fiction. Um, so stuff that's more recent, maybe published in the last uh, couple of decades or a few decades. Um, if, you, if you're a collector of something like that, more modern stuff, where would you start going to find books to add to your collection? Book fairs and bookshops. <laughs> and uh, online, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, if if you if you, as Susan said earlier, if you know what you're looking for, mm. it's much easier because you can probably find it on the internet. Um, but it's not quite the same thing because you, you can't feel and touch the book and smell it. Which, to me, that's important. Is is the tactile part of it? Um, one thing that we might talk about. I don't know if you want me to raise the subject, but collecting there's the um what 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 edition to collect um for instance here in canada um one of our main authors is margaret atwood as mm. everyone in the handmaid's of, tale. And, and and more recently testament yeah um, um now she's a very collectible author and um we have two copies of the same book here one published in Canada, the first edition was published in Canada. Uh, was it called? This is the Robber Bride. The Robber Bride. Mm. One of our earlier um, pieces. But, but the same book was recent. published in the UK the same year, looking completely different. Hmm. Well, totally different yeah, cover. Oh, yeah. Different tone, too. The, um, her big book. And my brain is not functional. Well, Handmade Steel. Handmade Steel. The Canadian and the American look completely different. Yeah. And uh, uh, some huh. people will what they call um, follow the flag. In other words, if it's a British, if it's an Amer a Canadian author, they'd like to have the Canadian first edition. If it's a British author, 
like that, the British first edition, American author, the American first edition. On the other hand, sometimes the book was published in another country first. So um, I'm trying to think. Salman, of Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children. Yeah. Hmm. The actual first edition was American, but he, he's a British writer. So do you get the actual first edition, pick up the American, or do you get the follow the flag and take the British first, first edition. edition? That's a personal or call. Or just to cover all your bases, get both. <laughs> but but as, far as, go, to, as far as places to look for, in that case, in the case that you're talking about, of the more recent books, the fiction, um, science fiction, again, you're looking for people who are specialists in that field you want to go to 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 find dealers who are modern first edition specialists um who deal in in science fiction and there are specialists who what they want is want to deal in is science fiction is interesting mm -hmm. books in that field um so they will be valuable people for you to get to know because they they go out and they that's what they're looking for to bring into stock, so they will be the ones who will have it. We might have an odd piece like the Negro Megas, like you know some other kind of odd things that we have, but we have them mostly because they're oddities, not because we deal in science fiction, science fiction per se, yeah. or or fantasy fiction or whatever. Um, one interesting thing that's going to that is starting to come up in that field is with people who publish in an e-format primarily. Huh. How are they gonna be collected? What's gonna, and especially yeah. those that do a crossover to a traditional publishing, what's gonna be considered first edition in the future? Is it going to be the print on demand copy that comes out of the e-publishing? Is it gonna be the one that comes and and you collect the e version. That's one. That's yeah. one I see as a conundrum, and I'm kind of wondering where that's going to go in the future. Um, you guys, that's a good point. I, I agree. It when I find a book that I really want, it frustrates me to no end when it's only in ebook form because I'm like, I'm not collecting digital yeah. words. I want the freaking thing to open and shelf <laughs> so yeah that's that is yeah, definitely a, yeah. An it's, it's a, it's a, yeah it's a different thing from reading on an e-reader whatever one you use that dual connection to the printed page is, is a, and uh i don't know where that's going to go in the future um there have been a number of crossover uh, authors, and I'm just, I'm really curious to see what 20 years down the line is going to be a, a collectible piece. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know on that. Um, Somebody's raised a question. I don't know. Um, if, if, and I, it could be quite important about storing books. Yeah, that? I was going to touch on that after this. So oh, sorry. good job. <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> yeah. Um, Henry, Henry Jones in the chat's wondering, how do we store our books? They get pretty voluminous pretty quickly. No pun intended. <laughs> um, <laughs> store them vertically um, in the way on, on a bookshelf. You, know, you might see them on the bookshelf next to one another. Not too tightly um, because the, the, the paper needs to breathe. In in the uh, climate that we live in, for instance, up here in this in the summer it gets very humid. In the winter it gets very dry with the heat, the central heating. Um, so it's important for the books to be able to the paper to be able to absorb and release the the moisture. But but you want them to be kept in the most stable place in your in your yeah. environment. Mm -hmm. um you want it to be you don't want it to be in bright light because that will damage books we'll fade it, fade it, um yeah. it'll also hit, hit the blues and all the other things um one thing i do want to say is please don't throw away dust jackets 
Oh, mm. yeah. uh, I did have a question about that. What was your opinion on the dust jackets? The dust jacket is going to be a huge portion, especially in modern books, of the value of, of your book. Yeah. If you throw the dust jacket away, there goes. Yeah. I mean, uh, um, to, to kind of give an example, if you took a Hem Hemingway first edition and it's a beautiful copy with a beautiful dust jacket, it's going to be worth 10 times or more than if you took the dust jacket and threw it away. Oh, if you no. don't like dust jackets, find a place, a, a drawer somewhere you can lay them out flat. Keep the books without the dust jackets, but keep those dust jackets. Don't get rid of them. Yeah. Um, Another thing, an important thing that, um, about storing the books is, uh, who was it? Um, Henry Jones. Henry Jones. Henry talked about, and that is when taking books down from a bookshelf, um, it, might not, it might not seem important, but how many times have you seen an old book? Can you take a, uh, bring a book out? I don't uh, have one that has that okay. problem, okay. but no. we'll, we'll bring three books out. Okay. When, you, when you take a book from a bookshelf, I don't know if you I'm can see. Lift them up. Yeah. Okay. Can you put them? Bring this down a bit. Could leave them down. I'm to press. Okay. If the books are on the bookshelf like that, can you see them? Yeah. So we've got three books sitting in a row. Is to, is to go to the bookshelf and pull it from the top of the spine. That's a no-no. Never do oh. that. Oh, oh, I do that every time. <laughs> no. What will happen is eventually the top of the spine will tear mm. and weaken. and weaken. Mm -hmm. And the book will lose its condition. You'll damage it. Be one of the factors. If you're going to take a book out, try to take it out from the sides like this. If necessary, push the books on either side so that this one can be then taken out like that. Oh. Is that maybe why older, older books, um, you know, when they're first making, like the bindings itself, they have like the little ridges? Better. Uh, no, the ridges are there. Let me see. I've got one here. This actually is a very good example of you can see the little ridges. You mean these here? No, not the not the ribs, but like on the side. It's probably just because to help open the book, but it creates a, a handhold oh, along the oh, outside. Okay. Yeah, where where your thumb Those is. Actually, that's just to give this give it open. A, give the hinge a good strong oh. place to work. It just is incidental that it it allows you to grab well. Um, sure. <laughs> If, you know, if people want to know little hints on how to handle a book, what room to put, the, where you should keep your books, um, how to take them off the shelf, how to open them safely, we do have on our, um, both our Facebook feed and on our YouTube channel, it's the only thing on our YouTube mm -hmm. channel, a series of videos um, that we called Great Questions Asked by Novice Book Collectors. And it covers what booksellers call fine, near fine, very good. Mm. Um, what different terms they use, folio, small folio, quarto. Because when you look at a bookseller's description, there's all kinds of arcane language in it. Mm. And this will we'll talk about a lot of our arcane language that we use. And the channel is just Wilfred M. DeFreitas Bookseller. Mm -hmm. um, and you can go and you can look at all 10 of them. One of them is very long, which I learned in, when I uploaded it, just how long it was. Um, but most of them are, you know, under 10 minutes. Um, so you can get, get a good feeling of, you know, um, just all kinds of things that yeah. you might want to think about as you start getting into yeah. book collecting. Uh, getting back to books on the shelves, because I see Henry has mentioned book, storing books in boxes. The the natural thing in putting books on a box would be to store them flat one on top of the other. Um, it's, 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 I don't like that. Because it, 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 like having them on the bookshelf, you shouldn't st stack them one on top of the other flat, because it, it doesn't give the, the, the paper a ch chance to breathe. But um, if you're in a situation where you're going to do that, I would say alternate the spines. Oh. So that you have spine on one side, spine on the other side. That at least you're not putting stress on the binding. Yeah. So that's something to think about if you are going to do that. But the one thing I would say, if you're going to put something into boxes, never do this. Never no. put them 
uh, spine, spine up, up. Spine yeah. up yeah. because that just pulls away from here, damages your joint here. If you're going to put them in, put them spine down. That way the weight of the paper is still where it can be supported. Yeah. Um, spine down, folks. Spine yeah. down. Yeah. So uh, either way, it, it this is better than this. This is better than that, but this is best of all. Uh -huh. So straight up and down this is as you would have it on a bookshelf right into the box is, is numero uno. Right. That's what they're, but you know, then again, you don't want to put something on top if you can help it. Sometimes you end up doing that, which actually noticed in our video, there are a few places where we've done that because of our space constraints. Yeah. Um, Try not to leave them in boxes too long, Henry. Right. <laughs> yeah. All right, so if I'm looking to build my collection, I definitely want to go and see the books in person if I can. I'm looking for book dealers who are part of a membership because they have a reputation to protect. I'm looking for um, quality. I, I want to be able to look at it. And also, I want to remember that if I walk away from this book, um, someone else might might mm -hmm. snap it up. So I want to go in kind of with a plan. Um, are there any other tips we should be thinking about um, to assess whether the book is one that we want to to purchase or not, because I might not have my cell phone on hand, so I can't like research in the bookshop. I might be at a book fair and I might need to make the decision now. Are there anything else I, I should be thinking about when I'm making that decision? Actually, you'd be surprised at how many people sit at the bookshop, at the book fair, and are doing this, checking the <laughs> bottles. They go, it happens. Yeah, I don't, I don't mind that. I'm quite happy to to stand by whatever we have decided, uh, however, however we decided to price or or, or grade a book. Yeah, um, we uh, feel it'll stand up against any anybody's um, anybody else's opinion. I think I think when you, though when you're looking at books, the the most important things are does it speak to me? That's number one. Number two is can I afford it? Number three is am I content with the condition it's in for the price that's on it? Um, because again, that is a balance sometimes you have to make because gee, I can only afford $50 on a book, but if I'm going to get a, a fantastic copy, it's going to cost me 200 or two and 500, whatever your, your particular balance is. Um, I think those are the biggest three, um, yeah. but the biggest of all is, does it speak to me? does this call to my heart and yeah. collect what um, you enjoy what you like yeah rather yeah. than than collecting books i would strongly recommend buying books as an investment strongly this, not recommend buying i mean them as strong, an, not recommend, recommend yeah. buying them as an investment buy them as, a, as an object uh, of if, love. If, they, if they happen to go up in value so be it um uh, kayleen before we came on live you had mentioned something about old books and just in general generally speaking um because a book is old, it doesn't mean it's worth anything. And because a book it's new is new or relatively new, doesn't mean it isn't worth anything. Um, you can have a the traditional, the, the staple thing, you find a, a Bible that's 100 years old. Most of the time, it doesn't have any commercial value. And I have to stress here that we as book dealers are always looking for, at, not for, but at the commercial value of right. something. The right. personal value where somebody has it, if it's a family Bible that's got your family's uh, tree or, or history history laid out in it, of course that's that's priceless. We could we could never uh, ascribe a value to that because we don't know how much it's worth to you personally. Um, so the two different things: there's the commercial value and the personal value. On the other hand, you also might have something like the first Harry Potter book. <laughs> as it first appeared. I mean, there were very small printing of that first book, mostly went to libraries and got beaten to death. Mm -hmm. So if you find a really fine copy of that, you're gonna be paying in the into the tens of thousands of pounds yeah. for it. Yeah, uh, I remember back in, God, I remember what grade, but it was required reading in that grade. The library had like 13 copies and we had to rotate reading them. What, the uh, Harry Potters? The very first Harry Potter, yeah. Yeah. Oh really? Oh, and it, yeah. they probably were were beaten to death, but there were only five hundred copies printed supposedly, and supposedly most of those went went to Australia, so they could be released there on the same day they were released with the second printing in the UK. 
I don't then know. Then we probably got some Nobody's random really other printing. Sure but. About the number. Nobody's really sure about where they went because nobody thought it was going to get anywhere much. On the other hand, the last book was printed in such huge numbers that you can find a really fresh copy for 50, 50 bucks. <laughs> so, you know, it's all, it's all in supply and demand as anything else. Yeah. There was some talk of, um, about books signed by the author yes. um, or books mm -hmm. with, with previous, uh, what we call provenance, books owned by important writers, people. important uh, people, yes. Yeah. Um, that, that can, a, a, a book that's not collectible for any reason, um, but has been owned, let's say, for ex exaggerated example, uh, a copy of a book signed by Charles Darwin would be worth thousands of dollars because it was Darwin's copy. Right. And if it's, it's got Darwin's inscription as he gave it to his wife, yeah. As a gift, it would be even more. I mean, oh my God, he gave this to his yeah. wife. Now that's that's a, that's an exaggerated example, right. but you know, mod, modern books. You, you've heard of you know book signings. People go to bookshops and uh, they have signings by authors. Um, it depends how you want to deal with the book. If you ask the author to inscribe it to you in at at the signing, um, that's that's fine because it, you, personally you're going to keep it and you won't, won't be wanting to, to sell it. But if you do ever want to dispose of it, it's probably going to be worth less than the book was just signed by the author. Hmm. But it not, might not mean not, as much to you. Might not mean as much to you, but to a, somebody else, a collector down the road, um, the book that's just signed rather than signed to a person um, is could be more desirable. I say could be because it's a very personal uh, choice. So that's something to think about when you go to conventions is how am I going to approach this author and, and get it signed? Yeah. If, yeah. You, if, you, if, yeah. if you're buying it for your own pleasure and you want it signed from the author to you, perfect. Yeah. Much the best way to do it. But if you're thinking down the road, well, I might want to sell this someday, having your name in it might not be so appealing to another collector. Unless you're a famous person. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm talking of people like us, not famous people. It's normies. Not famous. Okay. Well, they're famous. No. You me every, every now and then, you know, two weeks. What? How often do you guys go? Every two weeks or so? Every week. Every week. Okay. Like lose track. Yeah. Were there any <laughs> other things that you wanted to Just do? have fun chatting. That's what we do. There you go. Um, uh, were there any other questions that people had or not? I was just going to ask Lauren that. Was there any other... Um, bases that we haven't touched that you really wanted because all my stuff was touched so well i did have a question about uh bookseller scandals because i've heard so many stories from you guys about scandals but i feel like we could do a whole nother episode just on the scandals is there well, one uh, bookseller uh, scandal story that kind of pops out and you'd like to share you know we, there there are a couple that i'll i'll just mention uh in in passing for i don't know you may mention one or two um, a couple of them that you can actually. Oh, no, just at the good part, she cuts out. <laughs> okay, so she froze for you, too. <laughs> Come back to us to tell us all the juicy details. <laughs> we may we may have to do a write up on the on the juicy story after the show because she is super frozen. Oh, no. Boom, 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 right to get right right at the bits. Maybe it wasn't meant to be on air. <laughs> uh, we'll have to get them back on the show sometime. Yes. Okay. So unless they come back right in the middle of my outro, yeah. thank you everybody in the live chat who's come to talk to us about like the book collecting, like the side of our author writing really world that we might not necessarily think about as simple as how to take your book off a shelf. I never would have thought about that, but like it does, you're going to be damaging that, that spine and you you're picking up old books and you're like, why is it so bent up here? Cause it done been picked off the shelf wrong for too many years. Alrighty for Lauren Moore. I am Kayleen Williams. Be sure to check us out next week. We're going to talk about more reading, writing and everything in between right here on Keystroke Mediums, the writer's journey. Peace out. <laughs>